Hello from the World Economic Forum. My name is Adrian Monk. Welcome to this Africa media briefing with the World Health Organization. Delighted to be joined from Brazzaville in Congo by Dr. Machadizo Moeti and her colleague, Dr. Michelle Yao. We'll also be joined for this call by the Minister of Health and Population from the Central African Republic, the Honorable Dr. Pierre Somse, by Patrick Youssef, the Regional Director for Africa with the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva, and from Dadaab Camp in Kenya, uh, Adio Achul Diukweth, who is a South Sudanese refugee. Of course, we want your questions. Please use the Q&A function on Zoom to get them over to us. Uh, but we'll start, if we can, by talking to Dr. Moeti and getting an update on the very latest situation across the continent. Dr. Moeti. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. It's my great pleasure to be joined by the Honorable Minister of Health and Population of the Central African Republic, Bienvenue, Monsieur, Monsieur le Ministre, and the Regional Director for the ICRC in Africa, and uh, by my Miss Adieu, Achul Diokuth, uh, a young lady, refugee and university student, uh, to discuss the impacts of this pandemic on people living in very challenging, difficult and precarious settings and the urgent need to improve including for COVID-19. Sub-Saharan Africa hosts more than 26% of the world's refugees and around 19 million internally displaced people who have fled their homes due to violence and conflict often. During this global crisis, there are, these are among the most vulnerable people in the world to the COVID-19 pandemic. Due to challenges in accessing some of the difficult and humanitarian settings, cases of COVID-19 <clears throat> are possibly underreported and public health capacities for surveillance, testing, isolation, care and contact tracing are being scaled up wherever it's possible. In Ethiopia, for instance, community engagement, including in surveillance and infection prevention and control activities, is ongoing in all the refugee camps and sites where internally placed people are living. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in complex settings in North and South Kivu and in Turi provinces, laboratories are equipped to diagnose COVID-19, building on capacities strengthened during the Ebola response. I'd like to mention here that the government and partners in the DRC while responding to COVID-19 are also dealing with an Ebola outbreak in the Equator province. You, you'll recall that's where we had an outbreak two years ago. There are now 56 cases, and this is of great concern, particularly as it is now surpassing the previous outbreak in this area, which was closed off and uh, controlled at a total of 54 cases. Some cases are located in remote areas surrounded by rainforests, demanding additional capacities and resources for the response. And this just illustrates the fact that countries have to, at the same time as responding to the pandemic, then deal with other health problems. Pandemics. Returning to humanitarian settings in the crowded and sometimes very low resource settings, such as camps, and settlements, the basic preventive measures for COVID-19 of physical distancing and frequent hand washing can be incredibly challenging to implement. WHO recommends health screening for new arrivals, temporary isolation facilities for suspected cases, adopting activities like food distribution to limit gatherings and strengthening infection prevention and control practices including ensuring access to water supplies and hand washing stations and importantly ensuring essential health services for other diseases and conditions continue to be provided this week the united nations will launch an update to the global humanitarian response plan to scale up access to life essential services for health water and sanitation and food and nutrition for vulnerable populations this action is urgently needed. Already, funding shortages have resulted in reduced food rations in some settlements and imminent threats of increases in acute malnutrition, stunting, and anemia. As the reported COVID-19 cases on the African continent pass 
640,000, with 14,000 people having lost their lives. Global solidarity is needed more than ever in fighting this epidemic. And I'd like to just say here that we are seeing many governments ease the lockdown measures that have been put in place and bought some time in scaling up the public health capacities. So we should be expecting that in some countries there will be an increase in cases and we will all have to work together to then control what happens as far as those uh, increases are concerned. For at least three months now, vulnerable communities have been experiencing socioeconomic difficulties exacerbated by COVID-19. It is in the interest of peace, international security and equity that all countries and partners do more to assist the civilians affected by the violence and conflict. I therefore call on all parties to conflict to implement the UN Security Council resolution on COVID-19, focusing on our common enemy, the virus, and ceasing hostilities. I have to say here that we have a formidable ally and leader in Honorable Minister Somse, who has actively pursued using health as a bridge for peace in his country in the last couple of years. So I look forward very much to our discussion today and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mati. Um, Minister, can I turn to you in the Central African Republic and could you give people on the call an, uh, an update and an overview on the situation that you're dealing with there? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Moiti, for your leadership. It's with great pleasure that I'm responding to the request of uh, Dr. Moiti, my friend and sister, the Director Regional of uh, WHO for uh, Africa. Um, I'm happy to share with you our perspective on how the novel coronavirus is affecting my country and the challenge that the country is facing as a country in post-conflict uh, uh, situation. The first case of COVID in the Central African Republic was detected on 14 March. It was a motor, a motor case coming from uh, Italy. Until end of April, we were facing sporadic, mainly uh, imported cases from Europe with some limited local transmission in the capital, Bangui. And we started to screen systematically travelers at the road check point. Unfortunately, we were not able to maintain the benefit of those screening uh, at the main airport. Um, while uh, uh, when the major imported cases were coming from uh, 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 Europe, uh, because soon after with uh, explosion of uh, uh, the epidemic in the uh, the Cameroon, which is the uh, one of a neighboring country, which entertain uh, maintain a very close relationship with the country, uh, really uh, uh, resulted in a, uh, 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 um, cross border, a huge cross border transmission. If uh, uh, you know many cases uh, coming by road uh, from Cameroon. This uh, has resulted now in an explosion of the epidemic, which has now, uh, um, which is now, uh, um, uh, uh, which has become a, 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 a local transmission epidemic with a community uh, implementation, and uh, many cases occurring. We have uh, for uh, the last. Uh, Three months we have been uh, uh, registering uh, around 100, 150 cases a day only in Bangui. Uh, now we have been working according to WHO recommended this strategy, which is to isolate, test, test care for cases and trace. Uh, unfortunately, in a context of humanitarian crisis and post-conflict, uh, um, it is difficult to uh, confine people. So the main measures that are implemented in Western countries, which is which are essentially based on uh, confinement, could not be implemented in uh, in the country here. And uh, 
Now, what we have, we are doing is to, to really uh, do the, the politics of our means. Uh, this politics is based on first the, uh, the, the, the challenge for implementing confinement. That is due to many factors, cultural factors. For example, people continue to uh, organize funeral, uh, you know, uh, uh, the second one is people continue to go to market because we don't have supermarket market like in Western countries where you can regulate, uh, where you can you can uh, implement distancing policy. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, mask at the uh, uh, you know uh, disposal of everybody. So what we are we, we have decided to do is to have a, a very unique approach, uh, which which is to concentrate mainly on preventing death because what we have seen is that uh, 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 an, an increase uh, 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 increasing number of death with most of them happening in the community because of delay in a transfer to the to the hospital or because of uh, uh, denial uh, you know the denial is still huge um, uh, recognition of uh, the, 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 the of epidemic is still uh, uh, just uh, uh, among the a very small number of, of people. So what we have done, and you have a huge uh, 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 COVID is happening in a really a context of a very weak health system, and uh, uh, many uh, uh, um, uh, 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 many diseases. An epidemic of uh, non-communicable diseases, which are the the, the high-risk uh, factors for for COVID, for mortality, hypertension, diabetes, um, uh, sickle cell, and not to mention that half of the population is uh, suffering of uh, chronic malnutrition, which means uh, uh, for an important factor of vulnerability. If you consider that. One of the major mechanisms by, uh, uh, by which people are dying of uh, uh, COVID is uh, uh, lack of oxygen. Uh, so, and, and half of the people are living in a humanitarian crisis, a humanitarian situation. Almost uh, two thirds of them, uh, uh, you know, one third of them in, in, in displaced camp. So what we have done is to, to really focus on uh, uh, looking for those who are at high risk and making sure that uh, 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 they are um, uh, they are detected early enough you know, yeah. and, and, and brought to hospital in order to avoid them having complications. And one thing that I want to mention before I end uh, uh, this overview is that as a country in crisis, we have in the context of this global solidarity uh, uh, that of, of COVID, we are, we are really experiencing uh, a real challenge in accessing supplies. Uh, we have been functioning so far uh, uh, thanks to uh, Chinese donation. So this is a very important point that while we are all talking about global solidarity, uh, uh, this is not being experienced really by people in the Central African Republic in a at the, in, a, uh, uh, in a way that it is actually uh, presented. My recommendation here is that it is really important that this uh, conversation results in a greater sensitization and advocacy for small and fragile states like the Central African Republic so that we can access supply, we can access uh, 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 funding uh, and, and support. We have the support of WHO, but of course, uh, the global platform is not functioning. Thanks a lot. Minister, thank you for that very important testimony and for that uh, update on the situation in uh, your country. Um, I'm going to turn now to Patrick Youssef, who's the ICRC's Regional Director for Africa and also, I'm very pleased to say, a member of the World Economic Forum's community of young global leaders. Patrick, you're looking at the humanitarian situation across the continent. 
What is the situation that you're seeing from your, uh, from your position? How is the ICRC making sense of, of what's happening uh, to very vulnerable people who are now facing this additional burden of a pandemic? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Adrian. And I'm very honored to be <clears throat> on this panel with the prominent speakers. His Excellency has just made uh, impressive uh, remarks about a country that indeed is living the effects of a situation of violence and war since a number of years. So, I, <clears throat> as you know, <clears throat> Africa's wealth and diversity deems a thorough look at clusters of situations rather than a generalization of the effect of COVID or other crises on the whole of uh, the continent. And I'll, as you can imagine, I'll focus really on half of the continent. That's not accurate, but half of the continent, which is bleeding because of those situations of violence, because of political violence, intercommunal violence, as well as wars, like in Somalia, northern Mozambique today, the Nigeria's uh, northeastern part, uh, the Sahel, DRC, or South Sudan, which, as you know, has been living three waves of huge offensive in the Jongle region, which are very preoccupying, and where I would say the impact of COVID has been disproportionate compared to others, other countries, stable countries who have lived through the pandemic and probably went stronger after this pandemic. So the fear here is certainly on the knock-on effects, you know, the social economic impact of that uh, <clears throat> pandemic beyond the predicted fatalities that we may have uh, on, uh, on the continent. I want to zoom in on this notion of refugees and displacement and migration. You know, out of the 27 million refugees and IDPs on the continent, I want to remind everyone that almost 5 million were registered as newly displaced, people who have left everything behind and ran either within their country or outside the borders of their country to take refuge. 5 million. And the numbers are, are in rising as we speak today in the Sahel and Libya, which means that violence continues and hampers the, the delivery of health services in the most sensitive places where, as you know, social distancing uh, or physical distancing is impossible, uh, where a liter of water for hand washing is simply a luxury. Um, so violence also, as we know, creates a fertile ground for the virus to take hold and spread. So all in all, conflict and violence in many parts of Africa is continuing is driving death and injury. Over hundreds of people per day are injured or killed, as we recently saw in the Lake Chad region where our surgical teams on the ground work like never before. And I want to make a point here because we're also surrounded by health professionals. Health workers are not spared, as you know, by this violence. If Africa starts losing its health workers, which are anyway too few already, the entire system will struggle and will have an impact, not only on COVID responses, but on all other diseases. So this is a shared responsibility for the implementation, the application of relevant laws in the different contexts to make sure that this wealth of expertise we have is really maintained. I want to end by saying that with our Red Cross and Red Crescent partners, our commitment is to continue helping those who suffer in silence either in prisons, people who we don't see, who we call off the grid, or displacement camps. We're living under a 45 de degrees Celsius sun today in the Sahel, where we have just asked our donors uh, for more support, for all, not only uh, su support for COVID response, but also on other reads, needs because of the dual effects of climate and conflict. Our efforts are really directed to assisting and accompanying and coaching on the job forensic experts in 31 countries, supporting health facilities, health structures, water pumping stations. But we also want and need to learn from this COVID crisis, as from the ICRC, we're reaching out to other partners mm -hmm. and working together in complementarity in order to support more systemic support and general governance to help us achieve better results in the next, uh, in the next crisis. Back Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I want to go to Nairobi in Kenya, if we can, and hear from Adio Akshul Diukwe. Um, Adio, you're uh, originally from Dadaab refugee camp in the north of Kenya. 
um, which is the size of, uh, of a, a reasonable city, in fact. How are people in camps like the Dub coping with the uh, pandemic situation, given the incredible limitations that Patrick's just outlined on, on health, uh, on water provision, on sanitation? How are they managing? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Andrea. Yeah, so in the Dub, uh, I used to stay in Kakum and then moved to the Dub, but I'm currently in Nairobi uh, for educational purpose. So I will start with uh, all schools, the, the fact that uh, everywhere around the world, the school are closed. So the same thing to the Dub. So all schools are closed and most of the learners are facing the challenge for online uh, learning, which they are used to uh, classroom. So it's a bit challenging. And the other thing is the business have declined because of inflation. For example, we used to buy one kg of beans was a hundred shilling, but today it's more than that is 200 Kenya shillings. The other challenge that we are having mostly is the uh, social, uh, physical contact. It's, much, uh, it's not much being observed because of limited space. Uh, yeah, because of uh, limited uh, housing space in the camps. For example, we are having shortage of sh uh, shelter. Most of the youth are uh, sharing the rooms, uh, which make it hard for obtaining social, uh, physical uh, contact. Uh, the other thing is increase of teen pregnancy, not it only in the camps, both camps, that is Kakuma and Dada, but also in the nation, across the nation, that is in Kenya. Uh, the other thing is increase in crime uh, because youth are idle. They have they have nothing to do. They are just indoors, and that thing is bringing issues. Like somebody thinking of like I don't even know how I'm gonna support myself. So they are resulting in stealing. With that one, uh, we have UNHCR and other agencies coming up with how to help us the refugees in both camps that is in Kakuma and Dadaab. So the UNHCR has collaborated with Kenyan government to make sure that. Whoever visit the camp that is in Dadaab or in Kakuma uh, um, should go for a solution uh, quarantine area for 14 days and having to have, and before being released to the community, they have to go through a thoroughly test that is uh, either you are positive or negative. Or if you are negative, then you will be released into the camp after that. Before, if you find that you are uh, positive, then they will have to take you to a hospital whereby you will be treated. Uh, both host communities and refugees are working together to achieve this. The other thing is uh, uh, humanitarian agencies have set up hand wash uh, and sanitization in the entries of each block and marketplace. And in addition to that, each household is having a sanitation station in their own compound to make sure before you come into the compound, you have to wash your hands. After getting outside of the compound, you have to wash them your hands. The shopping place, that is the marketplace is free. People can, there's that freedom of movement in the camp. You can go to the market and come back. There's no that total lockdown in the camp. Well, it's only coming in the camp is an issue, but inside the camp, you can go to the market freely and come back. The other thing is um, the UN and local communication companies have collaborated mm -hmm. to make sure the refugee students can gain access to learning online by providing a affordable data bundle that is for the uh, tertiary level scholars refugees that is in higher education of uni uh, university and for the uh, primary and the high school that is the secondary school the humanitarian agencies have distributed radios and tablets to to learners for easy accessing the education program the mm. radio the radio only work with energy that is the solar it doesn't need electricity or battery, it's actually very easy to use. Uh, the other thing is the refugees themselves are helping in the fight of COVID-19. Uh, some refugees are uh, uh, helping in the fight of COVID-19, uh, sponsored by, for instance, some sponsored by Albert Esteem German Academic Refugee Initiative are distributing some masks and food items, not only to refugee, but also to the host community, mm -hmm. both in Nairobi, Kakuma, and Dadaab. Oh, right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Adi. Um, we can take some questions now, and um, I think we can go live to Cara Anna from the Associated Press in South Africa. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Hi, thank you for this. 
Um, Dr. Somse, uh, when you say the global platform for supplies is not functioning, can you explain what you mean by that and uh, give more details? And a, a second question is for any of you, what are the most striking examples of stigma you've encountered and how is that challenging your work in this pandemic? Thanks. Minister, can we just turn to you for the first question? Yeah, yeah. Platform, uh, as I said, I don't know how it is for other countries, but first, you are not in the list of priority countries, and so this has resulted in uh, the 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 us not being completely uh, overlooked in the uh, in, in you know in the, the, uh, the chance for access to uh, 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 to possibility for uh, uh, purchasing um, uh, uh, good. The second one is we have a fruit abiyocho. Uh, 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 all the supplies, all the uh, uh, equipment, and 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 and, and tests, and we are still waiting. We are waiting because I believe that uh, this is due to global competition, which is well known, uh, 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 which we can't understand. We can't understand because we keep uh, hearing on the radio that, for example, in the UK, you know. Uh, or in a similar country, you have around uh, a thousand of uh, million of tests being conducted every day. But here, we are dealing with uh, 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 you know uh, you know uh, hundred of uh, hundred of tests, barely two hundred tests every day, and we are uh, in a uh, you know in a in a scarcity scarcity a misery of tests. We have to rely on Chinese donation. Has not been the Chinese donation, we would have not, uh, not have done, you know, uh, 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 nothing, nothing at all. We would not have known even, you know, where we are in the epidemic, how much cases we have, if the virus is circulating or not. So uh, 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 this is what I mean. Yeah, this is what I mean, and I believe that this is a big uh, ethical issue, uh, uh, a, a big inequality. Uh, uh, crisis, which make which you know uh, point to the discrepancy between speech and uh, talk and uh, uh, and the reality. Has it uh, uh, pertain to our case here? Thank you, Sima, Minister. I did not understand well the question. Honestly, I think that there question. A second question. Yeah, I think that question. I'm going to turn to Adio perhaps to answer that question. Um, really, I think talking about any examples of stigma that you've faced in or that you've uh, encountered uh, in during this pandemic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, refugees naturally are people that are traumatized because most of the refugees flees home because of war. So the most recent uh, 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 situation that stagnated me or other refugees is the hearing of COVID-19 and that actually it's in the camp and some of our people, the people I know have it, have contracted the disease. It was really traumatizing because we just felt like there's no tomorrow, it's like the end of us. But at the end of the day, we find out that the UNHCR and Haji and other humanitarian agencies are working together for our own protection, they're protecting us and us also being involved in the decision making and also doing their sanitization in the blog and all this really calm us down. But that was the most, most traumatizing situation ever. Mm. Thank, you. Um, thank you, Adio. Can we go to Irene Ubani um, in Nigeria for her question? Thank you very much. With respect to all that has been said regarding um, global solidarity, I would like to find out what are the areas of humanitarian responses for which the World Health Organization has discovered that if expanded in scale would help healthcare workers particularly, so that organizations can start to channel all of their focus, all of their energies within these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moetti, perhaps we can turn to you for that question. 
Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I mean, first, let, let me just point out we're having uh, huge problems with connectivity in Brazzaville and missing some of the conversations. I hope our connectivity will be stable for a while. Um, uh, you know, in WHO, mm -hmm. we're putting communities very much at the center of uh, our response strategy to COVID-19. And so it's important that response strategies of member states supported by WHO and the partners um, take into consideration the health needs of communities and adapt accordingly planned actions. So we're working very much within the UN in the definition of uh, the actions that have to be taken in the humanitarian space and really trying to urge that link between the humanitarian work in health and um, the needs of the of the pandemic and uh, among the populations that are affected so some of the some of the adaptations that uh, i mentioned earlier and i very much liked the the the, the ideas and and the the innovations that the minister talked about that in, in, in instead of in a way taking taking a realistic view of the possibilities of some of the, the interventions, let's rather try to focus on those people who are most vulnerable to the bad outcomes and put our efforts there in, in, in ensuring that those outcomes don't come about. We work very much with humanitarian partners in an ongoing way in, uh, in countries where the situation is bad, like in, in the CAR in South Sudan, um, in parts of Ethiopia. So it's what we are doing is making sure that we adapt uh, part of what we've been doing on an ongoing basis to the context of the COVID-19 response, and especially to make sure that those basic services that the minister was alluding to, so for people with chronic diseases, for other infectious diseases, for immunization, are also taken into account as we work with the health systems, with the health workers of uh, our partners, partner agencies, to make sure that services are available for people. Thanks, Dr. Matty, and um, thanks for bearing with us, everyone, through those connectivity issues. Uh, I know it's not easy in uh, Brazzaville to uh, catch everything um, and also online. Uh, I want to go to David Andelman, if we can, from CNN Opinion. David, do we have you on the line? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, how much of Africa's comparatively restrained numbers on COVID-19 compared to other parts of the world is due to the lack of testing and, and is simply concealing far deeper problems that could help reseed other parts of the world this fall or winter. Hmm. Uh, I think, um, Minister, you touched on the difficulties that you have in, in testing large numbers of people. Um, perhaps I can turn to you first for an answer to David's question. And he's asking, is that lack of testing hiding a much bigger public health problem. What's your perspective? Dr. Samsei. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, we, we, we suspect that it can, uh, it, it's hiding a major public health problem because we cannot really have uh, the, the real the real situation uh, uh, throughout the country. Um, uh, we have an indication based on the, the, you know, the small possibility of testing that we have because we have been using the test very strategically. Uh, 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 so, uh, but I think the, the question remains uh, through our strategic approach that we need to, uh, we need to to take care of those most vulnerable because you know what is what matters the most in this epidemic what matters the most is that we avoid a uh, 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 high mortality and impact human impact and an economic impact and in a country like central african republic we which a country which is highly vulnerable highly fragile uh, economically politically uh, uh, security wise it, 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 you know, it is all, almost the, the whole population that is vulnerable. And uh, uh, among them, uh, those who are the most vulnerable having those comorbidities uh, and those diseases. So if you could have a possibility for testing them, at least testing those 
the thing half of the population, which is which is the third of what the, the amount of testing done in in the UK or I don't know how many million it is being done now in the US. Uh, 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 we, we would be able to really to contain the epidemic. So mm. uh, uh, yes, this is a really hindrance, a real hindrance to uh, uh, to to response to our response. Okay. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Dr. Moetti, given the constraints that we've heard of from uh, Minister Sumsay on testing, how concerned are you at the WHO that we're really missing out on the vast extent of this potential problem? Just checking. You're on mute, I think, Dr. Moetti. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. Uh, yes, thank you. We, we, our connectivity really is problematic. I just want to check that you can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you. And I don't know if you caught the question there, which was about, is the lack of testing uh, hiding a much bigger problem mm. uh, across Africa? The minister talked about his yes. problems with testing large numbers of people. Mm, yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that the, the, the lack of uh, testing kits is uh, particularly in um, some of the low income countries that are very much <clears throat> dependent on international support for procurement, uh, but increasingly all these in other countries who, who can afford to pay but don't have access to the, to the supplies. There is some degree of underestimation of the cases because um, the, the, the testing then is limited to those who are exhibiting symptoms in most of the countries who are coming to a health facility. There's been some attempt in some of the other countries to try and promote early testing people who have been contacts of others to come forward themselves and be tested. No doubt that there is, a, there is an underestimation. But we've seen that in some of the countries that have managed to increase their testing capacity, it's not in all countries that you get then a commensurate increase in the proportion of tests that come back positive. So there's a diversity of uh, in the situation. There are countries where the more you test, the more you find in terms of uh, some of some of the percentages coming back positive being up to uh, sometimes 10, 8%. In many of the countries, uh, say in Senegal, for example, when Senegal produced uh, their own test kit and then expanded significantly their testing, the proportion of those who were positive did not go up. So it, it meant that um, the testing wasn't uncovering hidden cases. I think that it is a, a mixed situation. There is a certain degree of underestimation. We've had waves as well in the capacity for testing. At a certain point in time, WHO and uh, working with the Africa CDC and the Jack Ma Foundation were able to get some tests into countries. And here we saw an increase across the board. So I would say there is some underestimation. I don't think, though, that we have a, a massively underestimated situation where thousands of people be sick, dying, undetected from this virus in African countries. And I very much agree with Mr. Soms that in this situation, that it's best to target strategically so that you prevent mortality. And then uh, the more we are getting these rapid tests, we are suggesting that those should be... Dr. Matsu, we lost you there for a moment. We'll try and get the connection with Brazzaville back up and running. In the meantime, can we go to Mike Mwaniki uh, from Kenya, Media Services? Don't know if we can get Mike up live. He's in Nairobi in Kenya. Just going to see if we can. So we're, we can see Mike, but we, we can't hear him. Perhaps we can hear you now. Mike, your question. No, we're still struggling. We're having a real connectivity day today. Um, Mike's question uh, is, how many cases of COVID deaths have been reported at Dadab refugee camp? And how are camp officials ensuring physical distancing is being observed, bearing in mind the levels of congestion in the camp? 
Um, maybe I can hear from Patrick Youssef on that. Patrick, how, how do you manage um, to get any kind of physical distancing in, in conditions in camps like the Dab? And how do you protect both refugees and uh, people working in camps? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think the, uh, there is no simple answer. The, when we see 10 families living under one tent, it's just simply impossible to apply certain norms that we can easily see happening uh, to different levels of success in, uh, in, other, in other environments. So the, the, the first and initial uh, response is indeed enabling the displaced, the host communities, all those around displacement camps to, uh, to have access critical for information. So information is considered as aid. And that was done indeed with the support of the myriad and the number of Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteers, even in the most remote areas. I would say also that there has been infection control measures that were put in place in these camps where we had distribution of hygiene kits and other forms of assistance to enable those, uh, those people living in these places to get the proper preventive measures um, uh, right. And I would say the third is adapting our food assistance because that hasn't stopped or any other form of assistance to respect these preventive measures. So meaning including during distributions of food assistance or water supplies, et cetera, that these measures are being respected. But I would say again, that for many, um, these measures have been implemented. Some cases maybe have occurred, but we don't know all the truth. And it's true that uh, as uh, Dr. Moetti has mentioned, we don't own all the truth, but we do try to do, even in places of detention, as those you know, ferry boats where one case, when one case is detected, the whole boat is basically infected. Uh, in these places where physical distancing is impossible, information has been considered as a major vector, passing on the information in local languages as we did, in local languages with local radios in order to create proximity and most importantly learn from other crises that we had to live through in mm -hmm. Liberia or in the DRC related for example to the Ebola crisis. Thanks for that. Um, just very quickly before going to Adiyo, I just want to take Kevin Kelly from the Nation Media Group in Kenya. Kevin, can we just get your question in? Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks. Uh, yeah, my question was similar to the one just asked about the uh, extent of the cases in the DAB. Uh, I'd like to ask the refugee woman herself, uh, to what extent is the UN being forthcoming with reporting on the infections and the death rate in the DAB? The last I saw, which is about a month ago now, the UN was saying there were nine cases in the DAB seems kind of low given the situation in Kenya and throughout Africa generally. Do you have any information on that? Thanks. We'll ask Adio. Thanks for that. Adio, can we just turn to you? And I mean, obviously you're in Nairobi now, but um, anecdotally perhaps, what have you, uh, what are your experiences talking to people who are still in Dadaab and maybe in Kakuma? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I've, uh, I'm communicating, actually do communicate with those in Kakuma and those in the DAB. Yes, I have a family in the DAB, so actually we all know what is happening in the DAB and in Kakuma. And yes, uh, it has been reported that in the DAB we had nine people. These are people who are coming in from Somali. They were put in a quarantine for 14 days, isolated area. And after some time, they have to go to test before they were released to the community. And at the end of the day, they were positive. It was too fast. And then the other rest, the rest joined in with the, posit with the positive results. So they were put into a quarantine place, uh, isolated place for medication. And so far, so good, everything is fine. They have recovered, and we, know, we don't even have any case at the moment in the dark. The same thing to Kakuma. The people that we, uh, the case we had in Kakuma, these are the new arrivals who are coming from the other part of, of, uh, of uh, Somali, going into Kakuma. They're also put in quarantine for 14 days, isolated uh, place. So when they tested positive, they were taken to hospital, and so far, uh, two have recovered and they have been released to the community. So 
I think the medical facilities being the UNHCR and the UN is, uh, and uh, the Kenyan government collaborating together with the refugees as well, it's actually bringing a very positive image to the community and also to the humanitarian agents. So I can just, in all that, everything is fine, everything is being catered for. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, et pour nos auditeurs uh, francophones, est-ce que c'est possible que Dr. Yao uh, nous donne uh, une sommaire en, en français uh, avec uh, les devel développements uh, nouvelles? Excusez-moi pour mon français. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Le français, il est, le français, il est parfait. Um, uh, Aujourd'hui, uh, nous faisons référence uh, à la situation Um, au sein des populations uh, déplacées, uh, notamment dans un contexte uh, humanitaire. Et dans cette uh, situation, uh, évidemment, l'aspect de, de COVID uh, constitue um, un, un enjeu uh, majeur. Et des populations qui vivent uh, dans une certaine promiscuité, ce qui rend difficile uh, les mesures de uh, distanciation uh, physique et les mesures de, de prévention. Et donc cela exige une approche particulière, notamment l'augmentation la, la, de, de l'appui sur certaines mesures comme le point de lavage de main, l'accès à l'eau potable et, et possiblement aussi la distribution de certains intrants comme les savons et si possible des intrants comme les masques. Cela a été fait par une agence sœur IOM au niveau du Kenya. Il y a aussi que c est, c est, le COVID limite l'accès à certains services de base. Et donc, cela exige aussi une certaine mobilisation pour qu'on puisse continuer à avoir accès à des services de base, comme le traitement, par exemple, de certaines maladies comme aussi des services de vaccination. Et donc, ce sont tous ces aspects-là pour lesquels une mobilisation est nécessaire. Au niveau de l'Afrique, on a une augmentation de cas. On a dépassé les 600 000 cas, les 13 000 décès. Et donc, il y a une certaine variété au niveau des pays et pour ces pays-là, certains pays ont un accès limité à des intrants comme des intrants de laboratoire comme M. le ministre de la Centrafrique l'a évoqué et ceci exige aussi une certaine mobilisation et solidarité et l'OMS travaille avec certains partenaires pour répondre à ces besoins critiques. Voilà comment on peut résumer la, le, le débat qui a eu lieu depuis le début. Yeah, merci beaucoup. Um, I want to turn now, if I can, to Takashi Ishihara from the Asahi Shimbun uh, of Japan. Um, uh, Mr. Ishihara, can we turn to you for your question? Thank you so much, for everyone. Um, my question is, under the current situation of coronavirus, I believe the refugee or IDP camps are one of the most difficult places to prevent the infection of coronavirus. And I hear like uh, some NGOs or international organizations are getting more difficult just for going to the camps or field or just going to approach the refugees. So in that situation, how has the international organization uh, like uh, UN, NGO or International Red Cross have changed the way of approach or operation and support for them after the outbreak of coronavirus? Is there any breakthrough for them? Thanks for that. And perhaps we can get the perspective from Patrick uh, in Geneva with the ICRC, and then perhaps also hear from the minister about how governments on the ground are able to work with some of those uh, NGOs. Uh, Patrick. So, um, con sorry, containing the, the virus is cer certainly the most complex uh, issue we have to deal with since years and containing the virus and uh, trying to create a cordon around uh, those locations, the displacement camps and prisons again, those are the two most prominent places where we would want to avoid at all costs um, uh, the, the spread. So again, we really had to adapt uh, our ways of working. Uh, I would also want to insist 
on the impartiality of humanitarian action and trying to get as much as possible uh, to have a dialogue with all armed actors on the ground. Where when we speak about internal displacement, we speak about a war, we speak about warring parties, mostly non-state uh, non armed groups with whom the ICRC, with which the ICRC wants to continue having a dialogue to get access, not only to the camps close to the capital, but also to the most remote places where COVID and the notion of COVID and the definition of COVID is honestly not even known and where the humanitarian needs have been on the increase. And if I can use this opportunity to say that as much as humanitarian actors are giving that space to get access to these places and make sure that preventive measures are also spread uh, that help, can help uh, the delivery of humanitarian uh, services. But we have also to say that we need to work with local actors, with the sheikhs, with the religious circles, in order to get that message across. In some occasions, as my colleague from uh, Dabab has mentioned, there were some cases of stigmatization that we had to work through and work around, including with local actors, which brought us into a different notion of proximity with those who can help us, meaning the communities who can help us deliver this, these services while protecting ourselves. And we shouldn't forget the duty of care that we owe ourselves and our teams and our volunteers on the ground. Um, I would like to go to the minister in a moment, but can we just turn to Aaron Baker from Time magazine in South Africa for her question? Um, Aaron. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been discussing some of the inequities when it comes to access to testing, prevention and treatment here in Africa. Are there concerns that the same inequities will be perpetuated when it comes to the distribution of a potential vaccine and how should African nations and health leaders address this issue? Thanks for that. In a moment, I'll turn to Dr. Moedi, but perhaps we can turn first to Minister Sumse, because Minister, you've been talking about the difficulties your country has been having in getting kits, in getting equipment, in getting resources. Uh, when it comes to a potential vaccine, how concerned are you that uh, the Central African Republic needs to be uh, included in the first list of, uh, of those able to access it? So we are we are fundamentally concerned. Uh, I was part of those who uh, you know uh, issued a, a, a petition uh, declaration uh, in order to require uh, equality in access to uh, to vaccine. And, uh, we have uh, uh, have just signed a request, uh, you know, to indicate our uh, willingness to be part of those who would uh, benefit from the vaccine uh, as soon as it is avail available. But the situation in accessing uh, uh, basic supply, basic goods, uh, uh, is, 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 is a source of uh, uh, concern. So we don't know how this uh, will be different for vaccine. So it, it's a real question. It's a real question that is raised. I would like to take this opportunity to also uh, tell you that we uh, our experience in terms of addressing the issue of uh, in the refugee camps or displaced camp we you know uh, humanitarian actors are doing a good job in our country they are providing those camp with water uh, with uh, tent for uh, uh, isolation of uh, cases uh, but uh, the, the challenge is that one denial is there, and people uh, and culture, people, uh, you know, don't accept to be uh, separated from the community, to be uh, to live in isolation in a in a tent. Uh, at the same time, uh, external actors are stigmatized because, as you know, initially, uh, the, the the disease is considered as being as uh, uh, being brought by Westerners. Uh, by uh, people from abroad, so humanitarian are stigmatized uh, for that. So we uh, and, and what we, we 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 do is that we are dramatizing the disease because I think what has happened also is that the TV and the news uh, and the way the issue were presented from outside has uh, uh, has really uh, uh, create more panic than it should be. Uh, and what we are trying to do here, coping with our situation, maybe 
It is a situation that you know causes us to uh, uh, to be more pragmatic. Uh, we, we, when someone is detected, the person can remain if it is a very uh, mild case. Uh, the person can remain among the family in the same house, wear mask, and but you know take precaution to stay uh, to stay aside. Uh, uh, and, and it works. We don't see a uh, full blown, we don't see uh, uh, contamination across the family. So, uh, uh, in those camps where people are packed, it is, uh, and people are afraid. You cannot take someone outside the community, uh, which is already uh, scared, uh, and, and put the person outside. The person, you know, it raises suspicion. So, yeah. I think, you know, from the government perspective, from my perspective, I think we have to de-dramatize, we have to simplify. Uh, this disease is not so highly contagious as we think. Uh, people can have uh, infection, you know, wear masks, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, just uh, uh, observe self distanciation from the family uh, with some education uh, and, and psychological support, it should work. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks, Minister. We've had three uh, encouraging but very early um, breakthroughs in uh, the vaccine process this week. Um, Dr. Moetti, uh, I want to go to you to close today's briefing in just a moment, if I may, and perhaps you can comment on, on uh, that question regarding the uh, provision of vaccines uh, globally. Uh, but I want to turn, if I can, to the last question to Marian Issa from FinWeek in South Africa. Marian. Thank you very much for taking my question. Um, it's for Dr. Moeti. Um, South Africa has the highest number of recorded infections on the continent. We broke the 300,000 mark today, and we're, we're recording more than 10,000 new infections a day. However, our fatality rate, thankfully, has been much lower than the global average. It's been about 1.5% so far. And I wondered, um, in that case, the early fatality projections that we got here um, would have been considerably overestimated. I wonder whether the WHO has more up-to-date projections. Um, okay. The related question is, you um, know... Thanks for that. We're down to our last two minutes of the briefing. So if I can, I'll just give Dr. Mori a chance to come in on on that question and also perhaps to, to close on the equal provision of vaccines across Africa. Mm -hmm. Dr. Moiti. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, South Africa's health system compared to many countries uh, does have the capability of providing care for people um, in, in terms of outcomes and the case fatality rate. So, and, and South Africa has been able immediately to leverage the capacity of the private sector as well as the, the use in the public sector. So we've seen uh, fatality rates that are not as high. Um, no, in terms of projections, we, we have not but updated our projections for South Africa. And I know that the government as well is working on this. I've heard slim and even the minister is saying, well, they are hesitating to put numbers to things, but they think that it's going to peak around September. I've not looked at the numbers at which they think they will peak. So this is something that we will work on, but it's clearly a very serious situation, which is essentially driving the pandemic in the region at the moment. So it's more than half of the, the, the cases that we're seeing in Africa. As far as vaccine access is concerned, I think this is a concern. This is a concern for us as well as for African governments and as well for partners. So there are certain actions being taken. Gavi, working with um, other international partners and WHO, has devised a means of trying to, um, if you like, pull countries' capacity together to secure some of the supply. Clearly, Gavi is going to be, in its usual way, supporting the Gavi-supported low-income countries in order to then uh, create shape, if you like, some um, a market uh, for access to vaccines, to the vaccine for, for the, the countries they're supporting. They've also contacted middle-income countries that are not supported by Gavi directly in terms of financing and asked them to indicate an interest and to start to, if you like, make a, a contribution so that, that the financing for procuring uh, the vaccine of the future can be joined between Gavi for low-income countries mm. and middle-income countries having indicated an interest. It's going to be difficult, I think. 
uh, let's, let's acknowledge it. And here, again, is our plea, I'll join the minister, for global solidarity. This is one, one area where we really will need uh, global solidarity in action by those countries that have the capacity to capture the supplies because they have the funding to do so. Dr. Moeti, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of today's briefing. Uh, a big thank you to uh, Minister Sumse for joining from the Central African Republic and providing a very um, pertinent uh, update on the reality of the situation that he and his country are experiencing. A big thank you too to Adio Achul Diukwep for joining from Nairobi, Kenya and providing a perspective from a uh, refugee background uh, to Patrick Youssef in Geneva from the ICRC, a big thank you. Uh, thanks most of all to Drs. Moeti and Yao for uh, battling connectivity to stay with us for the full hour. Thanks to everyone for joining from all of us on the call. Have a good rest of your day and look forward to seeing you at future briefings. Thank you. <laughs>